Listener supported. WNYC Studios. This is all of it on WNYC. I'm Allison Stewart, live from the WNYC studios in Soho. Thank you for sharing part of your day with us. Everybody, happy Banned Books Week. Now, to be clear, banning books is not a good thing. What we mean is let's consider this an occasion to celebrate and highlight some of those targeted books that are often filled with important perspectives, uncomfortable but necessary truths, and complicated ideas that deserve the deeper explorations that a book can provide. Okay, we'll cop to a little bit of the Streisand effect, adjacent curiosity. Trying to ban a book does make it seem a little more exciting, but it is a very serious issue. This year, Ban Books Weeks takes on an extra significance as anti-censorship organizations document increasing efforts to keep certain books with certain themes off shelves. According to a study by the nonprofit PEN America, over just the last year, 1,648 books have faced attempted bans across 32 states, including a batch of book challenges in New Jersey. The book Gender Queer, a Memoir, was banned in Wayne Township. Parents in Westfield tried to ban Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. And a Hunterdon County School Board passed a resolution banning five LGBTQ-themed books. It's happening in New York, too, on Long Island. Plainview parents complained that a middle school book called Front Desk about a Chinese-American immigrant family was racially diverse and tried to strip it from the curriculum. The PEN America report on banned books says what's happening is, quote, unprecedented, and it outlines a possible reason for the surge in book bannings. Half of the bans stem from efforts of about 50 advocacy groups that were mostly founded in 2021. Here's a quote from the report. More often than not, current challenges to books originate not from concerned parents acting individually, but from political and advocacy advocacy groups working in concert to achieve the goal of limiting what books students can access and read in public schools. Listeners, we want to hear from you, your banned book stories. How did you get around a book? book ban where you live, what books really weren't on your to-read list until you found out that they were banned, or let us know if you've been wrestling with any of these ideas of censorship or age appropriateness in your community, 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692, or maybe you want to shout out a book that you know is on the banned book list, but you'd like people to pick up and read. 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692 is our number. Let's get you in on this conversation. Social media is also available at all of it, WNYC. Joining us now is Emily Drabinsky. She's a librarian at the CUNY Graduate Center and has also been elected to serve next year as the president of the American Librarian Association. Emily, nice to meet you. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. What do you consider to be the purpose of Banned Books Week? I think the purpose of Banned Books Week is to raise awareness around efforts to Uh, that attack libraries and the services and resources we provide to our communities. I think it's crucial also to link the book bans that we're seeing inside libraries to bans happening elsewhere. You know, a context where books are banned more than anywhere else is prisons and jails, right? Where Mm -hmm. we see uh, increasing and intensified attacks on the right to read for for incarcerated people. Um, And also an opportunity to talk about libraries and the important role that they serve. Generally speaking, how does the American Library Association mark this occasion? The ALA marks this occasion with lots and lots of events and conversations. And uh, this year, we're highlighting our campaign, Unite Against Book Bans, which is pulling together organizations and individuals from across the country to stand against book bans and unite in a single voice. Uh, And it's an important campaign that we hope will both raise awareness and offer tools and resources for people to fight back against these attempts to ban books in our communities. As someone who is listening to this and thinking, well, what, what can I do as an individual? What are some of the things people can do to help keep books? Go to your library and check out a book. I think when we think about book bans, the sort of moral panic that we see happening across the country right now is one aspect of that. But we also have to think about book bans as connected to other ways that the state has banned books, essentially by defunding libraries over the course of the last four decades. We see uh, disinvestment, bipartisan disinvestment in our institutions uh, and the 
most important thing we can do is use those institutions. I think when it comes to the public good and to public institutions, we're in a use it or lose it scenario. So the first thing I would say is go to your library and pick out a book and yeah. tell the library worker there that you appreciate the fact that they're offering that service to you. I want to follow up on that because you you wrote, um, you tweeted recently, underfunding libraries is slow motion book banning. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, we see the sort of disaster happening right now, and it's very, very real. I'm from uh, Idaho is my home state and following the book ban efforts there, which aren't just, you know, sort of we're against an individual book and sort of filing a petition, but it involves armed uh, Christo-fascist right wing sort of extremists bringing guns to public meetings, staking out the library director's home. Like, it's really quite violent. But that's only one way that we ban books. Another way that we ban books is by ensuring that institutions can't function. So underfunding them so that we don't have the resources to purchase materials for our collection, so that we can't hire sufficient staff to select and acquire materials and to sort of describe them and make them accessible to you. Uh, Underfunding our capital projects and buildings such that, you know, the buildings aren't open the hours that working people would want to use them, that the, the spaces are not uh, well kept. Like think of any time you've gone into a library, there's a bucket somewhere sitting under a leak because of a problem with the roof. It's true of every library I've ever worked in, every library I've ever been in. And when we make libraries sort of Im make it impossible for them to do the work that they need to do in our communities, that's a kind of way of keeping books out of the hands of people also. Listeners, we'd love to get you in on this conversation. We want to hear your banned book stories. How did you get around a book ban where you live? What books really weren't on your to-read list until you found out they were going to be banned? Or maybe you have a book that you would like people to read, one of the targeted books. Please call us and tell us why. The number is 212-433-WNYC. That is 212-433-9692. We'd love to hear your thoughts about the banning of books. Our social media is at all of it, WNYC. That's both Twitter and Instagram. My guest is Emily Drabinsky, president-elect of the American Library Association. You know, you describe people showing up at meetings armed over discussions of books. These challenges seem so much more intense over the past few years. From your perspective, what's changed? I think that we have sort of allowed a kind of public violence that is new. And we haven't sort of framed the attacks on library workers as a form of domestic terrorism, as a kind of violence against public sector workers that needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed really head on and directly. I was at the Association of Rural and Small Libraries conference last week in Chattanooga. Multiple librarians told stories about having patrons throw books at them, that this would be like sort of an ordinary part of working life. So I think we have to think about library workers as the people on the front lines of uh, these sort of concerted attacks against the la one of the last public institutions standing. So if you see that, you know, it seems to me like the logical end game of 40 years of uh, sort of dismantling of the public sphere, and you're left with sort of libraries and public education as two of the last sort of institutions that preserve the public good. And that's, I think, why we're seeing the sort of level of heightened violent attack um, I don't, on I us. I don't even like asking this follow-up question, but are librarians, are we at the place where librarians need to have training for safety? I mean, I think what we need are more librarians, yeah. right? That like, one of the stories that I heard at the conference last week was from a librarian who said that her library has collaborations and connections that she's built with other public and private institutions in her town. That when the right showed up about a drag queen story hour and like who could be against story hour, right? It's just baffling to me. Um, it didn't get a lot of traction in the community because the community saw the library as the place that it was the where the diaper bank ran, was run. You know, it's like they have the community blood drives. And so in a lot of parts of the country, the library is sort of the heart of the community. And the thicker the connections we can make to our patrons and to our community, the more, the better we're able to sort of fight back against these incursions. So I think the last thing we need is sort of armed librarians. What we need are librarians to be fully resourced and supported. You mentioned you needed more librarians. Is there a, a, de a decrease in the number of librarians in the United States? 
there are about 300,000 of us, you know, and I don't have the numbers on that, but I think we can all, you know, I've never worked in a library where a cataloger uh, retired and they hired another one, right? That we have sort of, and that's, I think, true of of schools and uh, public higher education, public libraries. It's sort of a, across any kind of public institution, you've seen a dismantling of the of the people who make that thing go. This is a, a challenging question because I'm sure there are parents who are thinking like, you know, there there are certain books that I want to have some control over what my my child reads and what my child has access to, especially in schools. If I saw a book that said Johnny's mommy should stay home and cook and not work, I'd, <laughs> I'd want to be able to, to challenge that book. So how does the, uh, the Library Association um, think about parental involvement and parental control? Well, I mean, parents are responsible for parenting their children, and we are, as libraries, responsible for providing resources and support for the public project of raising children. Um, We have policies, right? Most libraries have challenge policies, and it's our task to defend the policy, not the Mm -hmm. book. Um, You know, and so those exist in libraries. But I would also say, if you don't want your kid to read that book, then make sure that they don't check it out. And, you know, the other thing I would say is one of the principles of uh, librarianship is that every reader has a right to decide for themselves what they read. And that includes children, you know. So my kid right now is reading Dune. I can't imagine a more boring book. Like, it just it's a genre I don't care about. I don't want to read it. I don't understand why he's turning his pages. Like, what is in his head? And he has a right to a private life as a reader, just like I do. My guest is Emily Drabinsky, president-elect of the American Library Association. We are discussing Banned Books Week. If there's a banned book you would like to shout out, we would love to hear about it. 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. Maybe there's a book that you really weren't thinking about reading, but you saw it on a banned books list and you thought, yeah, I'm going to read it. Check it out of the library, possibly purchase it. We'd like to hear. 212-433-9692, 212-433-WNYC. Emily, when you won your election to be the ALA's president next, next year, an article appeared in The Federalist. For people who don't know about that, it's a conservative news outlet that is really engaged in the culture wars. And they accused you of trying to expose children to content that's not age appropriate. It caused a public kerfuffle. Um, what did that episode look like from your perspective? Well, frankly, it looked absurd. I'm a university librarian. I've been a college and academic librarian for 20 years. Um, I'm not a, a smut peddler, and none of us are, right? Like, we, it's absurd on its face, right? Uh, what it looked like to me was an effort, you know, I think the right is looking for whatever bludgeons it can um, find, and mm-hmm. I'm one of those. I definitely have a political viewpoint um, that I share quite openly, but I'm one of 50,000 ALA members one of 300,000 library workers nationwide. Um, And, you know, from where I sat, it was just an indication of how uh, afraid they are of sort of growing, I think, movements to push back against them. Um, I don't, it didn't, I don't know, like I just muted it. I just ignored it. And I was like, well, they can't silence me and they can't silence my colleagues. And it's crucial in these moments that we be brave, that we be personally brave and that we be institutionally brave. And I'm really proud to be a member of an association that backs me and my colleagues 100 percent and uh, really grateful to the American Library Association for the support they showed to me during that time. Let's take a call. Line one is Robert calling from the Upper West Side. Hi, Robert. Thanks for calling all of it. Thank you, and praise to anybody that represents libraries. My question is this. The Supreme Court has said that dark money political contributions are considered free speech, but book banning is not a violation of the First Amendment? I don't get this. I don't get them either, but I don't, I, this, this concept is really, is, is really bizarre. Robert, thank you so much for calling in. Let's go to line two. Uh, Fiona's calling in from the Upper West Side. Hi, Fiona. Thanks for calling. Hi. You are on the air. Oh, great. Um, (laughs) So my question is, I guess, just as an ordinary person, um, how can I learn more about banned books or read them or anything having to do with them? 
Fiona, thanks a lot. What is the best way for someone to, A, help, Emily, we talked a little bit about checking out books, um, and to find lists of, you know, banned books. I'm sure we can we can go to Google, but mm-hmm. are there certain books that are sort of the, the greatest hits of banned books that people might want yes. to check out? Yeah, I mean, I, I would suggest going to uh, the website uniteagainstbookbans.org, which is the uh, home of the uh, a campaign by the American Library Association where you'll find lots and lots of lists and data and toolkits and strategies for support for supporting your local library and your local library professionals. And you know, honestly, if you think of any book that is by or about black and brown lives, black and brown authors, if you think about any book that is by or about queer authors, you can be pretty sure that those are being targeted for attack, just like the people Black, black, brown, and LGBTQ plus people are being targeted. So if you're if you're thinking, oh, is this book banned and it's by Toni Morrison, you can bet that it'll be on a list. My guest is Emily Drabinsky, president-elect of the American Library Association. We are talking about Banned Book Week. You are my guest as well. We'll have more of your calls after a quick break. This is all of it. This is all of it. I'm Allison Stewart. My guest this hour is Emily Drabinsky, president-elect of the American Library Association. In case you hadn't heard, it is Banned Books Week. That is our conversation topic. Please give us a call, 212-433-WNYC, if you'd like to join the conversation. If there is a banned book you would like to shout out, we'd love to hear. 212-433-9692, 212-433-WNYC. I do want to take Chandler, who is calling in on line four. Chandler, thank Thank you so much for calling in. Thank you for taking my call. It's very exciting. You're on the air. Um, okay. So I would call out um, The Kite Runner by Khaled Hosseini. I was for 20 years his um, foreign rights agent. And I sold The Kite Runner in 62 languages. And he has more than 55 million copies of all of his books in print. And I, I know that the kite runner has transformed the way people think about Afghanistan and they learned about Afghanistan after 9-11 and it makes me nauseous that it's banned. And also I just heard after that that, you know, Toni Morrison is banned and I used to be a, a foreign scout in New York City and my German client published Toni Morrison and she went to the Frankfurt Book Fair and she also should not be banned. Chandler, thank you so much for calling in. Emily, when you think about your role as the American Library Association's president, what do you see as the role, especially given these localized attempts to ban books from libraries? You know, I think the part of the role is doing things like this, talking on the radio about libraries and library workers and what we need and what we can offer our communities. I think uh, what we desperately need right now is an affirmative narrative about Mm -hmm. what libraries do, an affirmative story about what public institutions like libraries, like higher education, like public schools, what they can offer our communities, parks, all of those things. And so I think part of the role is uh, finding a narrative that resonates louder than the far right sort of story that we're all beholden to right now. We are very much uh, on the defense here and all of us know that we need uh, a positive vision for the future. And I think that's something that I can offer. Let's talk to Michael on line six calling in from Manhattan. Hi, Michael. Thanks for calling all of it. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Important conversation. This is sort of from the other side. I'd be interested to know what your guest thinks about banning books that promote violence and ethnic hatred. I, I, I don't think I would want to see Mein Kampf for the Protocols of the Elders of Zion or the Turner Diaries on a school library bookshelf. And I wonder what she would think about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, right? Books that foment hatred have no place. Um, but also we have an obligation as professional librarians to build collections that serve the needs, meet the needs of our communities. So I think one of the things that uh, I'm struck by in the conversation is the sense that 
regular ordinary people should decide what books are in the library. Like we are, it is our job, right? Like all we do all day is look at what's being published, look at what our community is reading, trying to find books that will meet the needs of our community. Kimber Glidden, who was under attack in uh, Boundary County, Idaho, and resigned from her position due to the violent threats against her, uh, I think said it um, quite, put it quite well, you know, and she said, it's, you know, and she had been attacked for not even having these books in her collection, right? She didn't even have them. That's how you know that it is largely performative and that mm-hmm. it is really about terrorizing people. Um, but, you know, she said that if someone requests a book and we don't have it in our collection and it's genderqueer, we'll get it on an interlibrary loan. If we get enough requests for it, we'll purchase the book and add it to our collection. That's what we do for a living. Let's talk to Ellen calling in from Monmouth County, New Jersey. Hi, Ellen. Thanks for calling all of it. Hi, my pleasure. I was listening to your show, and I just wanted to let you know that my five-month-old grandson was baptized last Saturday. My sister was looking for a card for him, and while she was there to purchase the card, she saw this sign, Books That Are Banned. So she went over, and she found this little board book for kids called Feminism for Boys. And she says, I'm buying that. So that's one of the gifts he got for his baptism. And it's incredible. There's nothing wrong with it. I read it. And um, the, just the title, maybe feminism. Was that what turned them off? Thank you for calling in, Ellen. Let's talk to Janet calling from Newark Airport. Hi, Janet. Thanks for calling all of it. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for taking my call. I just wanted to mention Ghost Boys um, by Joel Parker Rhodes. Uh, it's a fabulous book. Um, I mean, talk about kerfuffle. It was a huge issue. In my um, school district, I am one of the very conservative holdouts in the state of New Jersey, and and people thought this was, you know, promoting you know, anti-police rhetoric, and quite the opposite. It's just a fabulous book, so I really recommend Ghost Boys for everyone. Janet, thank you for calling in. Let's talk to, I think it's another Janet from Stanford, Connecticut. Hi, Janet. Thanks for calling. Hi. I just wanted to first just shout out to librarians. I can remember as a kid, my mom would take me to the library, and that was one of the safest, most amazing places I ever went. But there's another thing that we can um, resource for all of us. I don't know if you've heard of Ali Velshi's Band Book Club, but it was started in January, and every week he talks about a banned book. I have read so many books um, on that list that are amazing. Dear Martin, uh, shout, out of darkness, even things like To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, He talks, after he tells you what the book is, then he has a session with somebody, with the writer, if the writer is still alive, or uh, somebody who knows a lot about the book, and discusses it. And it is an amazing resource for banned books. Janet, thank you so much for calling in. My guest is Emily Drabinsky, president-elect of the American Library Association. It is Banned Books Week. So I want to play a clip, Emily. This morning on our news program, Morning Edition, we heard from Summer Boamie, an English teacher in Oklahoma, who was placed on leave for pointing her students to the Brooklyn Library's Banned Books Initiative, which helps students from anywhere, anybody, any state can access certain banned books. Let's listen to a bit of what she said. One text that my department had had a conversation about prior to the start of school. So the first day of school is is when the, the complaint came, um, was Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give. This is a text that's part of our official reading list. I taught 10th grade English, so that's English 2. We would do a whole class read with that text, meaning every student in class would read through that text, we would talk about it, we would do our, our activities. That text, because of course, it, it deals with very, very important uh, issues of, of systemic racism and, and raising your voice and uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, which is you know an incredibly powerful, significant movement in modern American society. We had a feeling that would be the kind of text that the legislation in our state would target. Um, And so there was some conversation about removing that text from the circulation or at least offering 
what I will call alternatives to lessen the chance uh, of a complaint. Emily, we're hearing in that conversation, teachers are making decisions to avoid breaking rules they might disagree with, sort of trying to find these alternatives. Have you been hearing this conversation among your colleagues? I think there's some of that. I think when you are already dealing with a lot, when you're already dealing with you know, a bathroom that doesn't work anymore with the fact that you are the last institution standing. So you're seeing the impact of of vast poverty, abandonment, organized abandonment of so many parts of society coming into your doors. Like the last thing you need is one of these moral panic challenges about a book Mm -hmm. like The Hate You Give, which is an exceptional read. And one of the only things I could get my kid to read when he was uh, 11, right? Like get him to read a book, which I think matters. Um, And so I think it makes sense that people would do that, which is why they need to know that all of us stand in solidarity with librarians as they push back against this. And we need to focus on the needs of the library workers who are on the front lines of the fight and give them the tools necessary uh, to organize against that and uh, to feel confident that they can take a stand and not be alone in that. Let's talk to Lauren calling in from Bergen County. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for calling all of it. You're on the air. Thank you so much. Um, The reason I'm calling is I remember when I was in high school in the late 90s, uh, one of my favorite teachers told me about a parent complaining about the book Snow Falling on Theaters by David Gutterson. And a parent had complained basically because there were scenes of sex and masturbation in the book. And this teacher told me this. So, of course, the first thing I had to do was go out and find this book and read this book, because if somebody was having a hissy fit about it, that meant it was something I needed to be reading. And I think that so many of these people people who are working to ban books, they don't seem to realize that that is what teenagers do. If you tell them they can't have access to something, the immediate thing they're going to do is go and have access to it. Um, and in case in point, when I go to ban, when I see those bookstore shelves of banned books, I've read 80% of those books because teenagers are just going to do the opposite of what they tell you tell them to do. Thank you for calling in. Emily, before we run out of time, are there certain books that you would like people to think about maybe reading that have been on these banned books lists? I think we know some of the the more obvious ones, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, some of the Toni Morrison books, ones that maybe people haven't heard of and that you would like them to check out. You know, I think the book that was most challenged this year is called Gender Queer, and I have more than one story about a library worker getting in trouble for Mm. posting a picture of themselves holding the book, for uh, talking about the book with uh, friends and patrons, and it's just um, a flashpoint. So I think that's an essential book to read, and the author is the uh, spokesperson for Banned Books Week this week. So it's probably one that's on your radar, and I think it's necessary for everybody to pick it up and read it. And let's be a little bit forward looking. What are what's something you're going to do when you take over as president of the American Library Association, something you've been wanting to really do? Well, I'm going to have a really big party and (laughs) my mom's going to be really proud of me. And uh, I'm going to really focus my attention on the needs of library workers and working to build organizing training into everything that we do as part of the association, because we all need the tools necessary to advocate for ourselves, for our patrons, for our communities. And are you concerned at all about your own safety? Not at all. Not at all. I'm not concerned about my own safety at all. I feel like uh, I am in this fight with so many people and we are all standing together and I feel a great sense of solidarity uh, just from the time I've spent with you on the radio. And so uh, what I feel is excitement about uh, the positive future that we're all creating together. We have been talking about Banned Books Week. Thanks to everybody who called in and made recommendations. You can continue to make recommendations on our social media at All of It WNYC. And thanks again to our guest, Emily Drabinsky, president-elect of the American Library Association. Emily, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Adnan Syed was freed this week. His legal case, documented in the hit podcast Serial, arguably launched a media industry. For Rabia Chaudhry, he was just a friend in need. If not me, then who? Because his family just didn't have the capability to deal with this. And if not me, he's going to die in prison. On this week's On the Media from WNYC. Find On the Media wherever you get your podcasts.